Let me introduce you the next speaker. Um, our next speaker is the ambassador of Estonia to Washington, Ms. Marina Kaljurand, became ambassador of Estonia to the United States on September 6, 2011. Previous to this post, she served as Undersecretary for Foreign Economics Relations and Development Aid in Estonia, as non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Kazakhstan, as ambassador to the Russian Federation and to Israel. In addition, she was the chief negotiator on accession of Estonia to the OECD and was head of the legal working group dealing with Estonia's accession to the European Union. Ms. Kaljuren earned a Fulbright Scholarship and a MA in International Law and Diplomacy from Tufts University, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, a Professional Diploma in International Relations from the Estonian School of Diplomacy, and an LLEB cum laude from Tartu University. She has also lectured at the Estonian School of Diplomacy and Public International Law international relations and foreign policy and diplomacy, and thought law at the Tallinn Economic Technical School. Ms. Ambassador Karl Jurand has been decorated by the President of Estonia with the Order of White Star III Class and the Order of the National Code of Arm III Class. Please join me to invite Ms. Kaljurand to the floor. You French pronounce our names much better than Americans do. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, well, first of all, I'm really, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here today uh, at the annual conference of cultural diplomacy. And although I feel much more comfortable when speaking about EU enlargement and NATO, NATO summit in Chicago, I still couldn't resist the invitation and talk about cultural uh, diplomacy, especially taking into account that culture and cultural diplomacy are, are taking more and more of my time as an ambassador, next to cyber, I should say, representing Estonia. When I joined Estonia foreign, Estonia's Foreign Service 22 years ago, I started in the Department of Public Diplomacy and Press. We didn't talk about culture then. It doesn't mean that there wasn't culture. Culture was there. We were supporting cultural events. Our first embassies were established in 1991 on the basis of cultural institutes and with the help of the personnel who was working for cultural institutes but there wasn't a concept or unified approach or even common understanding how cultural diplomacy could be used to full extent. A lot has changed since then. In my presentation, I would like to start with some general remarks, and after that, I would like to become very practical and just bring some examples from the practice of my country and from my personal practice, how we have used and how we're using culture and cultural diplomacy in our, in our work. During the last century, we all have seen how diplomacy has changed and how diplomacy is changing. The character of diplomacy. Before we were used to the traditional behind the scenes, gray characters. Nowadays, everybody is on social media. Even Pope is tweeting. <laughs> Our president is blogging. Everybody who is not on Facebook is not existing. <laughs> the essence of diplomacy has changed. If before we were fighting for each and every piece of information, then now we have really hard times working with the huge amount of information we're receiving every day, selecting the information, and also targeting information at different groups. Speed of diplomacy. Remember the medieval diplomatic missions that moved for weeks and months from one place to another, and now we have shuttle diplomacy. Reporting. I was writing handwritten reports, and when I started my career, I was cutting the newspaper articles and faxing them to my capital. 
today we're doing everything in internet or in other secure channels. The size of diplomacy has changed. Last century, you existed only if you were big. Today I heard that Ambassador of Hungary, uh, host of this event, did a great thing when he went to Stephen Colbert's show and played, performed there with his, with his rock band. I can say that even my country was mentioned in Stephen Colbert's show, Colbert Report. It was on the 24th of February last year when it was the anniversary of Estonia's independence and Stephen Colbert said, by the way, today is the birthday of Estonia, small state with a huge PR department. <laughs> so today, I think the size is not so, is not so important anymore, but efficiency, the niche, and how you target your message. And of course, tools and methods of diplomacy. Diplomacy is using tools that it didn't use before, cultural diplomacy being one, one among them. Although it's a very old phenomena, we still started using it relatively recently in a such a targeted way as we're doing today. And culture in its wide varieties is an excellent tool for fostering mutual understanding. I very much agree with the goals and philosophy of ICD. I think that today we all agree that the goal of cultural diplomacy is promoting peace and stability through intercultural relations. It sounds like a slogan, but it has a very, very deep essence and very deep reasons why to say that. Cultural diplomacy utilizes the many instruments of cultural and artistic life in a way which may make hearts and souls meet across borders. And I would like to cite one diplomat. His name is Karl Erik Norman, who is very well known in cultural community. He's a 30 year, he was a Swedish diplomat for 30 years, and he was the founder and the secretary general of the European Cultural Parliament the only pan-European forum for cultural personalities of all sectors of arts. Karl Erik Norman said, the starting point for cultural, sh cultural diplomacy should be, the other, meaning stranger, can be very intelligent. You may hate what he, she says, but, it's not, not, but it doesn't mean that he or she is stupid. This goes for communists, for Tea Party members, for Islamists, for liberals, or whatever group of human beings. We don't have to agree. We might hate what the others, strangers, say or do, but a dialogue could still be helpful. And I want to add that because in international relations, there is never too many friends. In some cases, culture can do much more if compared to professional diplomats and professional diplomacy. In some cases, culture can speak when diplomats can't. And I'd like to bring an example from, from <laughs> yes. And now, now the other, down, up and down, yeah. this one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I would like to bring, bring an example from my own experience. It was when Estonia celebrated its 90th anniversary. I was posted as an ambassador to Russia, to Moscow. Our bilateral relations were at a very difficult time. There was not much that diplomats could do in that situation and we were preparing for our Independence Day concert. We booked an opera house. We had an, we had an excellent program. We sent about 1,000 invitations. And 20 minutes before the concert, we were sitting and not knowing how many people will show up. But the concert, there wasn't ideology. It was just concert. It was concert of Estonian culture in Russian Federation in Moscow. But the concert was a real icebreaker. We had 800 guests, 
And in the end, the whole audience was singing together with the conductor, with the soloist, with the orchestra, and with the choir. And at that, uh, it was it was an extraordinary feeling. I, as an ambassador, couldn't do anything, but with all these people on stage, we could do much more. And I think that was maybe the first time when it really clicked what culture can really do in diplomacy. Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has, Foreign Affairs has defined the aims of cultural diplomacy as creating positive image of Estonia promoting Estonia as a tourist destination, and promoting trade. From these three tasks, perhaps I would like to, uh, to say some words about creating positive image of Estonia. We all know that creating a positive image is a never-ending task. You have to be creative, you have to be genuine, you have to be interesting, and you have to be short because there is so much information that otherwise people will not listen to you if they're not sitting in a conference and they have to do that. <laughs> so the first impression is very important and culture offers endless opportunities. And here I would like to ask, if you well, I hope that you have heard about Estonia before you came here. So, <laughs> so what's the, what is the first, what is the first either impression, word, emotion that comes to you when you say Estonia. Estonia is a small blue state in Northern Europe on the border of Sweden, Finland, Russia. The Baltics, bad climate, <laughs> boring people. I don't know what comes to your mind. But for us, it's much more important that Skype is the first thing, first thing, or is at least among the first things that associate, associate Estonia to you. Because Skype was invented in Estonia. You, so, and, and, and absolutely the same way. I think that for us it's even more important that you know that Estonia is ranking the third year in a row as number one in, globally on internet freedom. You know who is number two? US. Yeah. <laughs> Estonia is 99.9% .9 covered with internet. And our Wi-Fi is free. In hotels, cafes, in schools, in the libraries, in all community centers, and so on and so on. So it's the first image. I've seen lots of different campaigns promoting Estonia. And personally, I like the one where we can bring together something specific, something surprising, and something extraordinary. All these photos are from the campaigns promoting Estonia, positively surprising. So what did they say? The one with the fox. There are plenty of wild animals in Estonia, but there is even more internet access points. <laughs> The gentleman to the right, International Music Festival, cold Estonians in a hot summer day. <laughs> Down the capital, snowy capital of Tallinn, where by the way we have minus 20 Celsius today. Warm hospitality in spite of very cold weather. And finally, a very practical example of, of tourism. The, the young man is sitting in the sitting in the so in the marsh and still he has internet access he's using his computer and he's combining these two elements and from here i would like to move to very concrete examples how we are using our culture being a small country in promoting first of all is the cultural heritage here you can see the song festival and the dance festival dance festival and the song festival. I think we are a unique country. The tradition of song festivals was introduced in 1869 when Estonia was a province of Tsarist Russia. And the tradition has prevailed since then. Once in five years, one tenth of Estonia's population gathers in this field. Our population is 1.3 million, yeah? So there are 10,000 
no, there are the 25, 30,000 singers and 100,000 spectators. We think it's something very unique. So we want to show it to people. And of course, we are inviting people to come to Tallinn. By the way, the next Song and Dance Festival will be the first weekend of 2014. So mark it in your calendar. The documentary has been extremely popular, not only among the grown population who wants to learn about the history of Estonia and the history of Eastern Europe, but also among students. Hundreds of copies of this documentary were given to uh, American schools. So children are learning Estonian history, but it's also European history. And you all remember that EU member states be, uh, received the, uh, this year's or last year's Nobel Peace Prize. It, it was just because of the history, because of reconciliation. So when we talk about Estonian culture, it's not only Estonia, it's also Europe. Individuals. Again, when I was an ambassador in Moscow, in one evening we had three Estonian most famous conductors performing in Moscow. It never happens in Tallinn, in the capital. So we have to take advantage of that, that we have prominent persons, we have great personalities. And here you can see Arvo Bert. A couple of months ago, I was buying tickets at the Kennedy Center. And the cashier, I was discussing with my daughter in Estonian language, when should, should we go, what would we like to see? And the cashier just stopped us asking, what language are you speaking? We're speaking Estonian. He was looking at us and saying, oh, you're lucky. You have the most famous living conductor in the world, Arvo Pert. At the moment, our embassy, together with our institutions, is working to bring Arvo Pert in 2014 to New York, to Washington, and maybe a couple of other cities in the United States. I was present in Mexico City a couple of months ago when there was the word uh, premiere of a piece, uh, Madonna of Guadalupe, that he composed especially to the Mexican festival. It was great. And as Maestro Pert himself said, he felt like in a football stadium. Everybody was clapping, everybody was shouting, everybody was praising him. Sports people, sportsmen. On the right, Baruto, Estonian guy who's living in Japan, who is one of the most famous barutos in Japan. And trust me, he is better known than a student president in Japan. <laughs> He's a national hero there. To the left, our soccer player, Joel Lindpera, who played for New York Red, Red, Red Bulls, and, was, uh, and, and uh, starting from this week, is playing for Chicago Fire. He was so famous that he even had his cheer on the stadium with his name written on that. And people were asking for his autograph, not for Thierry's. <laughs> Although Thierry is very important, but our Lindpera was playing much better. VIPs. We all know that the majority of clicks come when you put on the photos of children and dogs, yeah? But trust me, VIPs are also very good. If not in their ordinary environment, if not in their office. The gentleman, second from the right, is our prime minister. And he's participating in the ever first ski marathon in Turkey. It was the ever first ski marathon in Turkey that we introduced. And because of lack of snow, they had, to, they had to make small circles, and they couldn't cover 42 kilometers. It was much shorter, but it was the question of principle. It was the first ski marathon in Turkey attended by Estonian prime minister and organized by Estonian embassy in Turkey. Second phase, the, well, how to say, the young man with the blue t-shirt, yeah? Our foreign minister, Urmas Paet. Last year, at a Nordic walk event on a bridge between Europe and Asia. In Turkey, it's the bridge over the, the Bosporus Bridge. Again, the ever first Nordic walk event that took place in Turkey and organized by Estonian Embassy in Turkey. Conflicts. Uh, I read about 
th that's very new. I read about it today in the morning. As a matter of fact, Maria uh, paid my attention to that from the Wall Street Journal. I have to tell you a, a little story about it. To the left, that's Estonian president, Thomas Hendrik Kilves. To the right, the famous economist, Paul Krugman. And last year, there was a, last year, there was a public spat between them. The question was uh, about Krugman's remarks about Estonia being a poster child for austerity defenders, although the country hadn't fully recovered from economic crisis. They tweeted, president answered, Krugman commented something, president answered, and now I learned that the American composer is going to write and transform this conflict into a short operatic work. Composer Eugene Berman and journalist Scott Deal found inspiration in the quarrel. The musical piece will be titled Nostra Culpa, Our Fault. These were the words that President Ilves used, ironically admitting being one of the dumb and silly Eastern Europeans. The financial opera has two movements, and it will be performed by Estonian mezzo-sopran Iris Oya as a part of Estonian Music Days, a 30 years old music festival. The theme of this year's festival is going to be collision and opposition. Perfect example. How to use a conflict. Food. Uh, in 2011, Estonian Honorary Consul to Arizona had an idea of giving out Grand Prix at a food festival taste award in Hollywood. And he gave the prize to the best online chef. The prize was a trip for two to Estonia. So the prize winner is, is the lady in the middle. Her, name's, her name is Average Betty. She went to Estonia. And to the right, you can see her with one of Estonian chefs, Dmitry Demianov. So you can even use food. Animation. That's a dog. And that's a girl. That's a girl dog. Lotta. <laughs> Translated in many languages. It is a big, it, it's a book. It's a cartoon animation, very popular among children in all countries where it has been published. Purge. Book by Sophie Oxenen that became also very popular a couple of years ago and created lots of criticism at the very beginning in Estonia. It, Sophie Oxenen has Estonian roots. Her grandparents were from Estonia, although she herself, the author, grew up in Finland. So she's a Finnish writer. She described Estonian life under communist regime very brutally. It wasn't a nice picture about Estonia. And it raised lots of question how a foreigner who hasn't lived in Estonia could write about us, about us who lived there, who knew it much better, and so on and so on. In the end, the book, as well as the movie based on the book, has promoted very well, not only Estonia, but also the crimes of the communist regime and the crimes of the Soviet regime. Estonian cultural days in France uh, last year. You might think that we're so close. We're sitting at the table of the EU. We know everything about each other. But that's not true. There is always something to learn. And it was the first time ever that Estonian national theater performed in France. And we are living in Europe. We are so close to each other. Estonian communities abroad. We call them our cult cultural ambassadors. Altogether, we have maybe about 100,000 of people who are living in different countries. Majority of them had to leave before, during, and after the Second World War when they just found refuge abroad. About 50,000 are living in Northern America. And I don't know if you heard, but Hemingway once said that in every port he visited, there was one Estonian. So what's our aim? What's what we're trying to do? We're trying to identify these Estonians so that in every community, or in every friendship group, or in every class, in every, in every work, uh, workplace, there is one Estonian. And that person is the best cultural diplomat we can ever have, an ambassador. 
to conclude, the potential of cultural diplomacy is great. I tried to bring some examples, definitely there are, there are much more of them, as I can talk for hours about that. And at least we in Estonia are convinced that in official diplomacy, the role of cultural diplomacy will, be, can, will continue growing. I would like to wish us all smartness and creativity in using cultural diplomacy. And finally, I know we're running into the question and answers time, but I, I'm ready not to take questions. <laughs> but there's one more thing I want to talk about and show. I just want to illustrate that, not there, that out there, we can't control everything. Sometimes we see, read, or hear things about our countries that we don't like. And I don't know whether it's right to say or not that bad, bad publicity is better than no publicity at all. I'm pretty hesitant about that, being a diplomat and representing my country. But sometimes there is something good, nice, and free. I would like to show you a clip. You can find it on YouTube. It's popular. It has, uh, by yesterday's evening, it received 57,000 clicks. It is 50 times more than our embassy has followers. Our embassy's Facebook has followers in DC. I hope that the number will increase rapidly <laughs> after my presentation. And just to compare, Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has 4,000 followers and Estonian police, 7,000. Estonian police being the most popular public authority among the people who follow it on Facebook. But now I'd like to show a clip. It's called Kaiti and Me. It wasn't ordered by government. It wasn't paid by government. It was made by strangers, the same strangers whom we see every day around us. I'm Mike. I'm Kim. Last year, we decided to rent a room in our apartment. We snapped some nice photos, built a website, put an ad up on Craigslist and waited for the emails to roll in. And roll in they did. One that stood out was from a girl named Kati from Estonia. This is Kati. Hi, Kati. Hi, Kati. Estonia, we thought. Where the heck is that? We took a trip to our local flight center to find out. Ah, Estonia. A small country on the Baltic Sea. Etsy. Or ST. Who would have known that one year later, this stranger from a country we'd never heard of would end up being one of our best friends? This is our story about adventure, friendship, and discovering Estonian spirit. Katy arrived and it was fun from the very beginning. We were like peas in a pod, or raisins in a loaf of kringle. We showed her what our life was like here in Canada. Halloween, Christmas, hockey, Canadian winters, good old fashioned fun. In turn, Kati taught us about life in Estonia. One thing we realized early on, Kati was really proud to be Estonian. Over morning coffee, we'd learn all about Granny, the farmhouse, long summer days in June, and Estonian history. Let's just say our Estonian training was rigorous. Estonia 101. Introduction to Estonia in 10 key lessons. Number one, Estonia is not Eastern Europe. Number two, two Estonian guys invented Skype. Number three, the song festival is awesome. Number four, the singing revolution helped the country gain independence. Number five, on YouTube, there's a funny advertisement for Estonian TV shot like the Simpsons intro but with Estonians in the countryside. Number six. Suvi is the second film in a three-part movie series from the 1970s, made in Estonia. It follows a group of friends over two decades. Mike fell asleep. Number seven. Kringle can be made with raisins or without, normally with. Stritzel is basically the same thing, but smaller than Kringle. Number eight. Estonians are very proud of their country. Number nine. Granny's farmhouse can be seen from Google Maps. And last but not least, lesson number 10. In order to truly grasp the spirit of Estonia, we needed to see Estonia for ourselves. Estonia 102. 
words to get by. Tare. Hello. Aita. Thank you. Turvi sex. Cheers. Mai ole lo tourist. I am not a dumb tourist. We only had five days in Estonia and we wanted to see as much as possible, so there was no time to waste. And Kati had a long itinerary planned for us. First stop, Old Town Tallinn. We got lost in the winding lanes and cobblestone streets and were amazed by the Disney like towers that surrounded the town from the medieval times. As Canadians, it's really hard to grasp how old the city is. Next up, the seaside town of Kasmu. We discovered an amazing maritime museum and an old piano that Mike got to play. We even had a moment to upload pictures to Facebook and call family on Skype back home, in the middle of the forest. Yep, Wi Fi in the forest. Kati brought us everywhere. We drove for miles and miles deep into the Estonian countryside, stopping at manors, castles, and taverns along the way. No stone was left unturned. Well, maybe one. Or two. Or two. We downed one liter mugs of beer and sang Estonian songs in an old gunpowder cellar in Tartu. She's like an angel oh, wait, that's Madonna. She's not Estonian. We even saw some traditional Estonian dress. I mean, traditional Estonian dress. It didn't seem to matter where we went, we were always surrounded by this feeling of togetherness and resilience, unspoken bonds, a pride in culture, and an admiration for the land itself. But maybe the best example of Estonian spirit was staying with Kati and her family at the farmhouse, seeing three generations of Estonian women balancing work, school, life, and still finding time to plant potatoes, milk cows, pick apples and feed the chickens on the family farm. It's this feeling that seems to hold everything together. The spirit. It's what bridges the new and the old, the city and rolling countryside, the medieval and modern, singing to Skype, granny to granddaughter. Our five days seemed to go by so fast and at the same time we managed to see so much of the country, met some amazing people and had tons of fun. More importantly though, I think we were able to get to know our friend Kati on a deeper level and truly understand where our pride and spirit come from. Or maybe all of this is wrong. Maybe Kati is just, well, I, I actually have no idea. <laughs>